You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. This is Andy Tanner, your host. This is where we make investing as simple as possible. So we welcome you. We congratulate you for tuning in. We, we've had a lot happening in, uh, in the economy in terms of inflation. And uh, a lot happens with the Federal Reserve and lots of talk about, you know, modern monetary policy. It seems that on the fiscal side, at least in my home country, the United States, there's no one inside. So we have a, a wonderful author, a tremendous, uh, tremendous knowledge here with Edward Chancellor is with us. And he is the author of The Price of Time, uh, the, real story of the Real Story of Interest, which is available at Amazon.com and uh, bookstores everywhere. Edward, thank you so much for taking some time uh, to give us some insight today. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you, Andy. Let, let's start here, just maybe a little bit of your background. Let's start, uh, just bring us up to the point of what got you interested in what you do today and uh, why you decide to author some of the books that you've, uh, that you've written. At university, I, re I read history and then I went into uh, City of London to work for an investment bank on the sort of investment banking side. It didn't really appeal to me. So I quit and I then wrote uh, a history of financial speculation in the, 90, in the late 1990s, uh, which was published towards the end of the dot-com bubble called Devil Take the Highmost. And um, after that, I became interested in the credit boom that was going on in the US and around the world. And so I then did another um, project which was published as a, a, a specialist report called Crunch Time for Credit in 2005. Shortly after that, I then took a job with the investment firm GMO in, in Boston, working for Jeremy Grantham. And um, after the financial crisis, I felt uh, that strange things were going on in the investment world. And um, we were in the asset allocation department where Jeremy and I worked. Uh, we were constantly surprised by these very low interest rates and bond yields. So I came to the conclusion uh, before I started this, uh, this current project that the, the very low interest rates of the last decade were really explaining a lot of what was going on in the world. High prices uh, in the stock markets, the, the, um, the sort of boom on Silicon Valley and venture capital, the you know, unicorns phenomenon, the, um, the investors chasing yield, um, yeah. you know, taking more risks in, in order to enhance their returns at a time of ultra low rates. And um, also unconstrained capital flows into the emerging markets and, and, a, and an extraordinary boom in China, a, a great real estate bubble, probably the world's greatest investment boom and a massive credit boom to go, all, all of which were related. And um, so you put it all together and it struck me that then that we needed a better understanding of what interest was, what it did, and in particular, given the uh, circumstances of recent years, what were the likely consequences or fallout from taking interest rates down to very low levels? Well, it, this is a, a fascinating time, and I, I think this is one of the more important you know, topics we could have on our podcast, because I'm not sure that the electorates of the world, or at least the citizen, the general citizenry of the world, thinks a lot about monetary policy and thinks a lot about interest rates. Uh, let me see if I, you know, and I'm I'm not the I'm more of a student than an expert, I think. But let's begin with the idea of buying power. If I want to uh, have supply and demand, you know, we can go to a basic e economics course and we can say. Uh, supply and demand helps us decide what a price is. If something's very scarce and lots of demand, the price goes up and vice versa. And you know, credit uh, enables people 
to buy things uh, more readily than they otherwise would. One can imagine very easily to hopefully not too rudimentary of an example, but one could imagine that if uh, a king waved his scepter and said, no more mortgages allowed, you have to pay cash for a home, uh, those prices would obviously plummet. The desire would be there, but the power to buy would be diminished. If someone weighs their magic wand and says, well, we're no longer gonna have student loans, the desire for that commodity would be there, but the power would not be. So when interest rates drop and when money becomes more accessible, you know, we can have huge surges in sales. And, and it is an interesting thing that if you borrow money uh, and you pay me, that money now in my account, to me, it's not borrowed its own, but to you, it's borrowed. So could you speak to what some of my friends have called almost a move from capitalism and almost creditism to where we have this tremendous dependence on credit to sustain growth. Uh, and and this, this requires cheaper and cheaper money to sustain. Could you comment um, on that? Or, well, I, or tell me where I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, no, I mean, I think you make, you know, these are all interesting points you're making. And the first thing I would say is that capitalism and what you've just called creditism are sort of one and the same thing. Um, you, you can see this, you know, capitalism emerges in, in Europe, in, in Italy, in the late Middle Ages, and that's associated with the establishment of banks. It's also associated with um, Italian merchants engaged in um, foreign trading across Europe, and then not just Italian, but then you get traders, merchants all across Europe meeting with fairs, and they actually uh, pay each other with letters of credit. <laughs> and yeah. in fact, actually, the, the, those letters of credit they even developed their own currency <laughs> um, to, to, um, to, 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 to um, settle their letters of credit. In essence, if, if I were to look at a US dollar or a, or, a, or a pound sterling, which kind of is a funny thing to call it a sterling, I guess you wouldn't add that anymore, but, but that's basically all a dollar bill is, is a letter of credit in some, it is a note. Well, all, 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 yeah, all paper currencies are yes. in effect, um, you know, sometimes people refer to them as as credit money. Yeah. Um, and, and I should go back to what you were saying earlier, you know, sort of supply and demand. The trouble with credit monies is that they are sort of infinite <laughs> in supply. There's no, 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 no specific restriction. But one of the things that does restrict the demand is the price of, of the credit money, the, the, the cost of, of money, of borrowing money across time, namely the rate of interest. And that, you know, if you look at in the earlier in the earlier periods, currency was based, you had a credit credit notes and credit money, but it was on a base of of precious metals of which the currencies were exchangeable into. Right. And that, in effect, put a floor under which, you know, the the interest rate wasn't going to sink. There was yes. something in the end, there was some gold or silver that you could convert your paper into. And that was a sort of that that provided a, a limit. I, in my book, I describe really the period when this first shift comes about, uh, when there's this Scottish projector who arrives in France in the early 18th century called John Law. And and France at the time, this is the death just after the death of. Louis XIV, uh, you know, the, the, the French king who'd, who'd bankrupted his country in war, run up enormous debts. And John Law said he had the solution to um, France's problems, uh, namely, and he suggested to the regent who was running France, um, he was going to establish a, a central bank, withdraw uh, the gold money from circulation, replace it with a paper currency and increase the circulation of paper currency in order to bring interest rates down. And he and Law said when he did this, uh, there would be a great prosperity. And Law was as good as his word. 
uh, and in the he 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 implemented this project, founding the first central bank in France, the Banque Royale, and um, and doubling the money supply and bringing interest rates down from about six to eight percent to two percent. Now, what the initial impact of that was that uh, Law also was running this company, which is well we now call the Mississippi Company, which is a company that. Um, that, owed, that basically merged and took over all France's trading companies and a variety of other activities, the, the tobacco monopoly, the, uh, the mint for coinage. Um, and it, it, it even absorbed all the French national debt. So it was sort of engaged in a, a massive, um, because it was funded by the central bank, it engaged in a massive sort of QE what we would call quantitative easing yeah. type um, program. And the, the share price of the Mississippi company went from 500 livre, the French currency, yeah. up to 10,000 livre. So a 20 fold increase in only a matter of months. And at this moment, law was um, deemed because he had a large share in the Mississippi company, <laughs> he, by his own reckoning, the richest man who had ever lived. So, so far, so good. And then it all began to unravel very quickly. And the money that he had printed uh, fed into the economy. It was a massive inflation of consumer prices. And in the end, Law, who had a third cap on, which because he, he was also the French finance minister, so he was head of its largest company, the central banker and the finance minister. As finance minister, he then had to sort of decide whether to continue with this project, uh, pr pushing money into the system, which risked uh, bringing, down, bringing about a complete monetary collapse or you know, withdrawing the, the, the paper from circulation, sort of what we would call quantitative tightening yes and he went for quantitative tightening and lo and behold the mississippi company share price collapsed and law was driven from office and forced to flee the country um and, and lived you know, abroad in exile for the rest of his life and what's interesting about this episode is that the uh economists uh look back on law and they ignore the failure of his of his project, but say, look, you know, Law is our is is the man who inspires us. He, you know, he is the founder of, of modern monetary policy, um, and and that's the sort, you know. And they say, you know, and you read the economists writing about Law. They say, well, you know, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen uh, are, are the heirs to Law. And, and so in the book, I say, well, if they were the heirs to Law, then you know. That slightly <laughs> slightly worrying state of affairs, and and yes. since I mean I finished the book last year, and really the events, you know, and if you as you remember, you know, the stock market comes to a sort of peak at the end of last year, and this year you see this, um, you know, rapid unraveling with the, um, you know, with the S and P sort of clap, you know, coming down sharply, going into bear market territory. The, um, the the global bond markets also now down twenty percent in bear market territory. So, one of the points I'm trying to make in the book is that this uh, era of very low interest rates created um, an extraordinary fragility uh, to the financial system, and then you know, as you had you know, the the last gasp was during these. You know, the pandemic um, everything bubble, where, as you know, you know the you know the stock market was sort of out of control. You had your meme stocks and your <laughs> your SPAC IPOs, and you yeah. had you know a whole load of cr crazy cryptos. You know, the crazier the better, and um, huge amount. You know, the last gasp of the central banks keeping interest rates low, and if you remember. You know, not so long ago, Jay Powell was saying, you know, I'm not even thinking about thinking about raising rates. You had, you know, you, yes. US and other real estate markets uh, going very strong. 
and um, you had masses of, you know, trillions of dollars worth of bonds around the world trading at negative yields. Um, and so I felt that um, we were really set, we'd really set ourselves up for a, uh, a period of, of, of great economic turbulence. Um, so when I was um, talking to the publishers, I said they, they should market this book as the first book of the next crisis. <laughs> <laughs> well, history often does repeat itself, and we certainly tend to, to fall into those same traps. There's a lot of moving parts to this. Part of this is, is politicians and their ability to promise. And maybe you could speak to this a little bit. When I sit down with my son, I have two boys, they're in their teens, and I'll say things that uh, I, try to, I try to sound rather sage-like, I suppose, and I'll say, you know, son, anything worth having is worth sacrificing for. And I'll say, son, the, the world doesn't owe you anything. Uh, you've got to contribute to the world. And what you get will depend really on what you give. And, and you know, all of these type of, of sage type of advice. And you would think if I took what I say to my sons about, you know, uh, pen, you know, fiscal responsibility and, you know, the world isn't fair and all these things. If I get on a stump speech and I try to say those things, same things as a politician, I'm, I'm going to get crucified. What politicians would say is everyone deserves an education. Uh, everyone deserves, uh, you know, an equal, you know, th this and that. And so they have to come up with money uh, to do these things. And it is breathtaking to me uh, to see the amount of money in Europe and the amount of money in the United States, just those two, let alone Japan or China or any others, the amount of stimulus, the amount of money that's been borrowed and the, the fiscal budgets of just how much money just goes to people, right? Yeah. Just, that we well, just would, to people. I would say two things to, to your point. First of all, um, one has to bear in mind that the central bankers are, uh, at least on paper, I independent of the politicians. So they're, they, they have their own reasons for setting interest rates at the levels they do. The, however, <laughs> this goes to your point, if you set interest rates at extraordinary low levels, you will uh, create an incentive to to profligacy. And what happened after the financial crisis, if you remember, is the US national debt roughly doubled, but the cost of servicing that debt fell in half. So the actual cost, uh, you know, apparent cost to the taxpayer remained the same. But that didn't mean that you weren't storing up problems because yes. there is, I mean, I think the problems can be seen on, on two levels. One, take the, um, the lockdown or shutdown policies that were instituted in 2020. To my mind, if those shutdown policies with their furloughs and so on had been, um, had been actually paid for uh, by emergency taxation, then right. I think people would have thought twice about them. Uh, yes. There was this sense uh, that, hey, we're all being paid to stay at home. The central bank is printing the money to buy the government debt. Uh, interest rates are at zero. Hey, there's never going to be any inflation around because our interest expectations are anchored, as the economists say. And so we can all sit, sit around, you know, watching Netflix or whatever people were doing during their lockdowns as if there was no cost. And to my mind, yeah, that was extraordinarily extravagant activity and the you know the, the surge in the money supply that occurred then i, I think is is you know uh, primarily responsible for the um you know, for the inflation wave that we've seen i mean you know inflation is a complex subject you know uh, one could go on forever about it but um and and the central bankers today and many economists like to deny any connection between printing money and um, and inflation, but but clearly, if one looks, you know, throughout history, the great inflations have been associated 
with the expansions of the money supply. Yes. Um, and, and also, as I say, with, with distorted interest rates. So the, so you can see the, the John Law episode that I was talking to you about, that all happened in a very short period of time, so 18 months. What we've um, experienced uh, has, has been really a sort of 13-year process. Yeah. Um, and it's, so it's taken much longer to draw out. But it, to my mind, it's followed the same type of trajectory. How, how do we reintroduce... The uh, you know as as we speak when you say thirteen years you know I, I think of someone who maybe got into business at, in their thirties and now they're in their mid forties and they've you know interest rates of five and six percent are completely foreign to these people so what would you say about reintroducing the idea of interest I mean the the title of the book is the price of time you know what this has to do with you know bond yields and and yield curves right i'm buying the the, the real story of interest yeah, how, but do Andy, we, that how do we title, how's that to go back to your point about sort of thrift and economy I mean, the one reason one needs a price on time is that that determines how efficiently you use capital if i put no price on time I mean, this was true of, you know, I mean, it's, frankly, it's true whether it's the use of capital or, the, or just the use of someone else's <laughs> time and labor. If you don't put a price on something, you will use it badly and capital yes. will be used poorly and allocated poorly and it will be mispriced. Or its valuation will be inflated if there is no price on time. And, you know, we can... It's, you know, one of the things I write about is that there does seem in, you know, in human nature, a natural tendency to, to value present goods or enjoyments, pleasures at a higher rate than something in the future. So what, what, what they call time preference. Mm -hmm. And if, if we have a positive time preference, then all our judgments will have built into them if you will, a, a discount rate or, or interest rate is in, I can either do something for you today or I can do it for you in a year's time, but it's sort of more valuable for you, for you if I do it to you today. So the value of something uh, in the future is, is always some, somewhat less. So um, one of the points I'm trying to make in the book is that a, you know, a complex uh, capitalist system, which involves you know, saving and spending and valuing and investment, something, all of these activities taking place over time, that something has to coordinate the entire system. And it, without that system being coordinated, it then starts to fall to pieces. And actually, and then it goes, this then takes you back to the government again, because as the system falls to pieces, then of course you get more and more calls for the government to step in and do something. And we seem to have um, been going down this route in recent years of setting a rate, rate so low that the capitalist system ceases to function. Uh, one consequences of the asset price inflation that I mentioned is a rise in inequality and younger people, yeah. as you know, can't get, you know, can't afford to get uh, to buy houses and, and, and so on. And, and, and you get this sort of discontentment with the system and lackluster economic growth. And then everyone says, um, you know, we, we need the government to step in and, and, and make good. So that's the, um, you know, from a financial perspective, um, as I was saying earlier, we, we're at a sort of a moment of financial fragility. And I think everyone, you know, who has opened a newspaper or turned on the TV this year will recognize that that's the case. Uh, but underlying problem, uh, we, is one in which uh, we need to sort of rediscover, um, you know, the, the, reinvigorate the capitalist process, and 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 one of, and one way in which that'll happen is when interest rates come off their their very low base. So, so we have limited time, and you've been so gracious with your time. I mean, it just flies, and I I just want to draw everything out that I can. So. Let me ask two things if if I can push our time a little bit. Are you okay with that? Sure. Two more. First of all, there's a very uh, 
seductive idea. I don't know that if it's if it's a new idea or if it's just a repackaged idea of modern monetary theory, where the idea is is that uh, it's not really about deficits. It's just about controlling inflation, and that unlike a business that must be able to service debt with sales and production, governments don't need don't need to abide by those rules because we can certainly burn the tally t- sticks. We can simply tax, and by creating a tax, that creates a demand on money. Uh, it makes it in demand, makes it more scarce. The more you tax, the more scarce the money comes. So since we can produce it and put it in and tax it and pull it out, and we can tighten and ease, uh, deficits don't matter. Could you give me your thoughts on, this is a very seductive idea that, oh, you know, we could, we could print trillions of dollars and cure cancer. We could print trillions of dollars and develop AI before China does. Uh, what's your thought on, on, on modern monetary theory where deficits have no consequence? In fact, uh, people like Warren Mosler, uh, Stephanie Kelton, they will say, Hey, if you have an empl- unemployment, it's because you're not spending enough. There's not enough government stimulus uh, yes. to, to create unemployment. Yeah, no, well, I'm, my view is that modern monetary theory is, is an idea whose time has come and already gone. Uh, I think that, um, again, I would see this, the idea of you know, what people call the magic money tree as, um, you know, as really a sign that we've been living in very strange times, the sort of Alice in Wonderland world. And um, the, the, the MMT people argued that, you know, that yes, that, that governments couldn't go bust, uh, they didn't need to issue bonds to finance themselves. But the, and, and in a way, you, you couldn't fault any particular aspect of the MMT theory, but the underlying idea was that governments could finance without limit and that the inflation could be controlled. Uh, and look look where we are today. So there was Stephanie Kelton, you know, coming out with this, um, you, know, uh, you know, in recent years, I think she published a book a couple of years ago. The, the deficit myth. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was all posited on the idea that you could control inflation, governments could control inflation and all they had to do is when inflation came along, they could either um, raise taxes or yeah. issue bonds. But, um, and I actually ha- wrote a sort of, I had, there was a sort of debate in the Financial Times in which, you know, Kelton and my pieces were set side by side a couple of years ago. And my argument was, you know, that the, the authorities always, ne- they never see inflation coming. I mean, you or I might see it, <laughs> but, you know, right. the, 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 the sages never see it. And when it comes, they won't do what's necessary to remove it. And here we are you know, with inflation at, you know, around about, you know, close to double digits, double digits in yeah. Europe and, and the US. And, um, you know, the, the interest rates raising tiny bit, but they're not, you know, the, the, they're not raising the taxes to take the inflation out. Of the, they're not doing anything that the, that the mon- modern monetary theorists would um would would on paper uh prescribe and i think so it's all very well to you know it goes back to you talking to your children it's all very well to spend the money but you know, when it comes to balancing the books they're not really prepared to take the harsh medicine of balancing the books and you know and you can see why because the, you know everything would then you know all the prosperity they had created the illusory prosperity would then be be taken away, and in fact, actually, I found you know there is a uh, you know I mentioned Lewis Carroll and the, and the you know and and Alice in Wonderland, but Lewis Carroll actually in one of his books writes about you know uh, what he calls the Outland Emperor having a a, 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 sort of a magic money act in which they print money to make everyone better off. So I mean, it, it, you know, Lewis, it's as if Lewis Carroll sort of envisaged the craziness of MMT. Edward's book is The Price of Time, The Real Story of Interest, available at Amazon.com and and bookstores. Uh, Pick it up for sure. Uh, One of the things that I often 
repeat on, on many podcasts when I find an author in a book that I truly feel is a must is, is you know, I, I could speak with Edward all day. When I get to the UK, it would be wonderful to have dinner and just share and, and draw for hours and hours, you know. And you can do this with a simple stop by amazon.com. You can glean uh, what he has thought about and what he's written about. So it's a wonderful thing. Now, the, we've talked about this rather systemically. My opinion is, and I, I'm wrong so much, but I don't know that there's the political will to, uh, you know, to shut the faucet off. It, the, the idea of, like you mentioned during the, the lockdown, if we had an emergency tax that said, yeah, you know, we're going to tax gas, we're going to do a consumption tax, maybe a VAT, or some type of emergency tax, we might have looked at things differently if it come out of the pocket. But it, it is so seductive to say, you know, we're going to do infrastructure and we're going to do this and we're going to tax rich people. It's not going to affect you. You know, all those seductive things where it's, it's achievement and lifestyle without sacrifice or without work. So let's say systemically that we do not have the political will you know, in the in the in Europe, in Japan, in, in the United States to to change this systemically. The last thing I'll ask you is, so that means that I've got to deal with this as an individual. That means that I have to look at what may or may not happen politically with the Fed, with with fiscal policy and monetary policy. I've got to ride this through as an individual. And and really my podcast has kind of become towards that that end is my message to people is, look, we can't control what they do. Maybe they fix it, maybe they don't. But now it's almost incumbent to defend ourselves and to take care of oneself, really. And so and, uh, do you, I, and I, I, I agree with you. Um, I mean, do you have the, any thoughts on that? Well, the thrust of my argument um, about the problems created by these very low interests and the buildup of debt uh, and and you know, working a lot, you know, supported by the central banks, printing money, expanding their balance sheet is the the end game was always inflation. I, I think so. In in a way, the the inflation, you know, extremely perilous uh, because it involves you know, massive transfer, you know, volatility and um, and 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 massive transfers of income and wealth from one person to another. Uh, However, in the end, it will sort of pay down the debts and probably in the end, you know, we will get a monetary stabilization, normalization of interest. But we, we don't know when that's going to happen. You wouldn't want to put your money on it happening any day soon. Yeah. So in the meantime, you're going to have to deal with this financial market volatility against an inflationary backdrop. Um, and you know, this year... Um, I think everyone, you know, however prudently they'd arrange their portfolios, unless they held them all in, you know, dollar cash, uh, realized that, you know, the age of, you know, thinking that <laughs> you were smart just because your portfolio went up has come to an end. Um, I think now that, I mean, you, you probably whether, you know, the US tips, inflation protected securities, have got positive Nine, yields on them. 9.6%. Yeah. Uh, and I, the, I think the I bonds. I think the tip. I think the tips are, you know, are, you know, they're not necessarily sort of, you know, tax tax efficient for individual investors. Uh, I think the tips should uh, probably the sort of bedrock of of any portfolio. For, for um, people, let let me interject here. For people that aren't familiar with tips, is these are bonds that are in, that are adjusted for inflation. And in the U.S. market, there's there's a couple of these. There's one called an I bond but you're limited to $10,000 per person in your household and they're non-marketable. Tips are marketable. And so they don't quite have the interest rate that an I-bond does, but tips, you know, if you want to trade them, you could, if, if you could liquidate those easily. Yeah, and they have a easily. positive yield with yes. inflation protection. Yeah. And, and then I, I think, you know, one has to, as you, I mean, your listeners know about rebalancing the portfolio. For sure. You know, so for sure. so I think you have a sort of tips portfolio and then, look for you know e equities and other assets when they've sort of reached attractive prices but i i think you know and 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 
be aware that inflation is very cyclical, that everyone tends to think that inflation, when it's rising, is going to continue rising, and then it comes crashing down, and then it comes back again. So you, you have to learn uh, to deal with the with with the sort of with the with the volatile inflation cycles. And the other thing I think is that one you, one of the things I write about in the book is that as consequences of, of this very low interest rates, all household assets have been inflated. You know, US household net worth is is probably you know, 200 percent of GDP higher than average. And that's not because, you know, things are more productive. It's just the, the valuation, uh, the, you know, the discount rate applied to all these assets yeah. has been very low. And, and so I think that um, if people have, have got to uh, understand that in aggregate, uh, that the expected returns going forward from their portfolios uh, are, are going to ha have these, these headwinds. And so I think one, you know, one, one doesn't want to sort of, in a way, again, going back to you speaking to your children, you, you've got to really be quite modest about your expectations for investment returns and your expenditures based on them. So you have, I think, uh, you know, not, not to be too aggressive going forward. I, I think the age of sort of, you know, spe uh, of, <laughs> of, of speculation, of, of, of aggressive speculation, which you know suits the you know the you know the the Nasdaq high flyers. I think that's probably behind us, and and that people want you know the the value stocks, the cheaper stocks have sort of turned around in the last year or two, and they probably provide better inflation protection. So you you buy the value stocks, stuff that's cheap relative to its earnings and and book and intrinsic value. You know, to uh, your point. And you own a lot of tips. You rebalance your portfolio. Uh, and and don't spend too much. <laughs> Your point. Probably, you're probably what you you make a great point is that we have had uh, in my and this is my opinion we've had a tremendous detachment from fundamentals when someone focuses on the stock prices. Uh, you know, in, in cre I mean, really relative to earnings, uh, our price earnings we we're paying so much for stocks. Even today, they're a little high. But on the other side, what I get excited about is you, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, historically booms and busts that happen, you know, in this cyclical nature. And I'll tell you, just as they can become detached uh, from fundamentals to the upside to create a bubble and a bust, uh, a nice bust can create a bargain. In other words, yes, it, I'm the only thing I can say. Instead of trying to time the chart, instead of focusing on the price, I say, you know, look at this company staying power, you know, are, are they going to survive over, you know, there's many, many billion, billion dollar global companies that will survive things, you know, people still need goods and services. I yeah. think a person should look for fundamental opportunity in the next year, two years, I think they should really buy based on fundamentals, and say, look, I might not be able to time the bottom, but once it hits a certain threshold, I have a bargain here, would you concur? Yeah, I mean, I think if you you look at a company and see what its earnings have been averaging over the last ten years, and then compare it to the current price, it, if you think you can, you know, historically stocks have returned about you know, six six and a half percent real. If you're buying a stock that 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 has that type of um, earnings yield relative to it, you know, relative nice. to its share price, then you, you probably won't go far wrong. You, as I say, you as you know, you get very huge amount of volatility. It doesn't mean the market isn't going to go down a lot. I think there's, you know, I personally think there's probably good opportunity. I think Japan, particularly for US-based investors at the moment, given how weak the yen is, I think you can pick up a lot of value. The market was, you know, relatively good value at the beginning of this year. And now I think with the yen marked down, it's probably for US-based investors an absolutely you know, astonishingly good value. And uh, so you. I would have thought that's one of the places that you know one will will probably preserve capital and, and, and make a decent return over the next few years. I will tell everyone how much I love Edward right now because I have many PhDs on, I have many economists on, and they 
they're, they're always ready to talk about uh, inflation or MMT, but when it comes down to what does an individual do, they run for the hills. So I'm grateful <laughs> that, that you know, you're able to step up and say, hey, this makes sense uh, to get a little bit of education. Do people, last question, I'll let you go. Ben, so gracious with your time. Talk about education for a moment. Do you feel that the electorate in the UK or in Europe or the citizenry, uh, your, your book is so important because I feel one of the biggest problems is ignorance, that people, you know, they've learned to get a job, they've gone to school, they've become an engineer, an accountant, or whatever they become. But talk about ph- financial literacy um, and the place that, that, the role that plays. Well, I mean, first of all, I think that actually one of the, one of the byproducts, useful byproducts of, of, of actually investing for one's own account is it actually forces one to become financially literate. And, and I think investment, you know, I, I started um, life as a historian at, at university um, before going into finance. And I think that one of the advantages of being a historian is that you're, you're sort of multidisciplinary, you're looking at everything. And yeah. the investment world you know, we've been talking a you know a bit of you know we've been talking a bit about valuations, a bit about inflation, a bit about this complicated subject of interest. And one is you know one has to be multidisciplinary, and you have to you know we haven't even talked about controlling one's own emotions and oh. this and that. Um, and I, to my my view, is the problem today is actually not so much a lack of education, but over specialized educations in which you know the. Everyone is, you know, um, everyone's sitting there, narrow speciality, building models uh, that are just abstract representations of their own, of the sort of theories of their discipline. And they never see, and th- this is true whether, you know, economists or epidemiologists or, you know. Somewhat compartmentalized. You name it, yeah, just, yeah. There are a lot of, lot of people sitting there with models o- over-specialized. Um, and I've seen it, you know, we get this, you know, in the investment world, you know, I've seen it, you get these quant investors who've got a lot of, you know, there are a lot of good things about the quant investors, but yeah. they can be very, they can be over narrow and, and therefore not see what's not, in, what, what isn't in the model. So I think the, um, the aim, both from an investment perspective, but also from one's own, you know, to make one a better citizen <laughs> is to actually broaden up one, broaden one, one, one's knowledge. Um, I liked your, your term multidisciplinary. Uh, yeah. I, I agree that it becomes somewhat compartmentalized sometimes in a person's cubicle or their own world. I, I do believe there are some basics though, you know, fundamental analysis is about fundamentals. When I go to a doctor, there are vital signs that are key to everyone. And I think understanding interest the, the price of time and understanding the real story of interest would be a foundational, you know, rather, no matter what, that's a broad, that's going to apply to everyone. Understanding uh, what monetary policy is and how it's tied to and yet tries to be divorced from uh, fiscal when it really is tough to do that. And I think those basic uh, tenants, just fundamental education are huge. So, I would just say it again. The book is called The Price of Time. Time is so valuable. We don't get that back. It should have a price on it. <laughs> uh, you know, I have something in my office called the life calendar where it's it's 90 years. I'm being optimistic. It's 90 years of life in weeks. And every Monday I can take my little pen and I can check off another week. And it is astounding to me. Uh, how that's impacted me as I've gotten older, as I see that beginning to shrink now, you know, where I'm over halfway, if I even get that far. So the price of time is a legitimate notion, the fact that time is valuable and that it can be paid for. Uh, This real story of interest is a foundational part of a person's financial education to get that breadth and that foundation uh, to hopefully not just survive, but to thrive in some turbulent uh, times that I think are going to be uh, falling upon us. So I'm grateful for, for your effort to write the book. I, I think it's a wonderful way to give of your knowledge. And I hope people take advantage and add that to their uh, library. Well, uh, there's a very generous comment, Sandy. Any final words for someone who is, you know, we have a lot of savvy investors, but we have a lot of listeners who are new. 
And they're a little bit afraid about, they, they've heard that when collapses happen, you know, their job could be in jeopardy and they want to have investments. What would you, what would you counsel those people uh, as, we, as we close? Well, I mean, the good news when a market falls is that your expected returns from any investment rise. So it's much better. It's a sale. To be buying today than it was yeah. to be buying in uh, in in um, in December, uh, and 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 therefore you know one has to basically there's no there's no prize for for pessimism in the long run. Uh, in the end, if you're, you know, in, investment in difficult times requires a bit of courage. Uh, but we know that, the, you know, America is a very, in particular, is a, you know, is a very strong economy. And what, regardless of what people say, actually a strong democracy. And um, that, you know, historically, for 200 years, the equities have returned, as I say, six and a half, seven percent. And they probably won't quite achieve that uh, current level of pricing, but I expect the market will come down and offer you know a a um, that return. So you, you can, and probably the best way for these for the new new people to is to go to Robert Schiller's website. You know, yep. who, Schiller uh, Index, Yale, and he has this thing called the Schiller PE price earnings ratio. Just want yeah. to just see what the average return valuation of the market has been over time over this 200 years and you know frankly when it when it gets to that level and when it goes if it goes down down you want to be um, you want to be investing and just not worry too much about immediate losses you know i mentioned japan to you today I mean, yeah. i'm invested in japan i don't you know yeah i pro- you know i've lost money this year it doesn't doesn't really bother me because i'm thinking five years time i'll then see whether i've made a mistake or not well, I don't want to be a spoiler alert on the on the Schiller index, but I will tell you the mean on that is 15, 16 over the past 200 years. We've been up in the high 30s. So that yeah. should also tell people something else that if you're in a in the United States, it's called a 401k, you know, in Canada, it's an RSP. But if you're buying stocks every day, you've been paying pretty high prices from an earnings perspective over the past you know, few years. Yeah, well, the low at rate. end of last year. You're getting stock. less stock per paycheck you're putting in because you can afford less because the prices are high and yet you're getting less earnings. So I yeah, love the show. And if you're young and you're, you you know, dollar cost average, yeah. in a way the lower the market, you know, the, if you're working and, and investing into a pension that's yes. going into the S&P, the best thing that can happen to you is the market to go fall in half and then fall in half again? It's a sale. If, it, if it were to go set down seventy five percent, you'd be yeah. laughing. <laughs> I get excited. I look at stocks like Apple and I think, boy, I just root for like if I could buy it at this level again, right? Because you, you, here's here's a great way to put this simply: if you're new, pick up any stock chart you want of any stock of any time period you want, and say, if I could do it over, when would I would have bought? And you'll pick the bottom every time. That's the best time. So I love your optimism. I also think, uh, again, the education piece is huge. The price of time, the real story of interest. Pick it up at Amazon.com. Uh, Edward Chancellor, such a delight uh, to spend time with you and, and glean from your experience, especially historically. Let's learn history so we don't repeat uh, the, the mistakes of the past and the future. Thank it's you so much, pleasure. sir. Pleasure. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.